Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, as you just heard, I'm a journalist at Bloomberg. I'm based in Dubai, and I head Bloomberg's um, team that covers energy and the energy transition in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And today we're going to be speaking about global energy uh, security amid all the shifts we've seen recently um, with geopolitical dynamics. I'm going to ask if each of the panelists, panelists could briefly introduce themselves, starting with uh, Caroline to my left. Hello, hi, it's wonderful to be here. Many thanks to the organizers. Uh, my name is Carolyn Kassan. I'm the Associate Dean at the New York University Center for Global Affairs. And I think something maybe also interesting um, going into this panel, I teach the geopolitics of energy, so I feel really excited about this, um, this conversation. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Modell. I work out of Washington, DC. I'm the CEO of an energy consulting firm called the Rapid N Energy Group. Uh, before that, I spent a lot of time in the United States government around the world focused on geopolitics. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frank Fannin. I currently am managing director of Fannin Global Advisors. Uh, my consultancy focused on the intersection between geopolitics and the energy transition. Prior to that, I served as the inaugural U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, uh, running the Bureau of Energy Resources. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Damilola Olawi. I'm a professor of law here in Qatar, as well as the UNESCO Chair on an Energy, Environmental Law, and Sustainable Development. Um, I study the legal dimensions of energy security, and I teach in these areas. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we've obviously seen huge shifts when it comes to energy security and any energy geopolitics in the last year and a bit. Um, in the immediate term, what we've uh, seen is Russia's invasion of, of uh, Ukraine roiling energy markets and sending oil, gas, and um, coal prices soaring last year. Um, it's also, at least according to most analysts, uh, led to or accelerated the, uh, the transition toward cleaner fuels and, um, uh, and renewable energy. But I'd like to start off with... Um, uh, I'd like to start off with Europe, and if you might, uh, if you might call it this sort of immediate uh, energy crisis uh, we have related to the war in Ukraine. And Cameron, starting with you, we obviously saw natural gas prices uh, surge to record levels last year. The situation was particularly difficult for Europe, or Western Europe, as, as Russia cut um, pipe supplies. This year, we've actually seen a bit of a turnaround, and gas prices have dropped hugely, uh, not just in Europe, uh, but also in Asia and in the US as well. So I'd like to start off by asking, is the energy crisis over, um, at least for the next year or so, uh, as far as Europe is concerned, or is that not the case? Well, Paul, thank you very much for that important question. Uh, my quick answer is no, the energy crisis is not over. It's also really important that when we look at, when we're talking about Europe and to look um, east of Europe, um, the crisis that is ongoing in Ukraine in terms of targeted attacks against um, Ukraine's energy infrastructure and the brutality of, of, of Russia's reinvasion. Um, Europe now, when we're kind of getting close to the end of what, what is known as the winter season, that I think Europe has fared much better than what was anticipated. So going, if you go back a year ago to February 2022, I think there were deep concerns, real concerns, that you know Europe would experience blackouts, that um, reductions in Russian gas um, would really sort of debilitate um, European economies. A year later, due to a number of different reasons, I think Europe has, um, has been fortunate to be able to withstand um, you know, a number of different challenges. Uh, they also had a very uh, relatively warm winter, which was advantageous because um, they actually didn't even go through their um, gas storage levels. Um, the United States was able to increase liquefied natural gas exports into Europe. Uh, we saw more piped gas coming from Norway and coming from Algeria, and you saw, you know, demand mitigation in the form of conservation. So I think, you know, a year later, uh, 
Europe looks 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 okay, but I think there is real concern about what next winter and what the next year holds. So even though we've seen uh, stabilization in gas prices, you know, I don't think that we can count on that being the case moving forward. And Scott, what are your thoughts on that? Do you also think that uh, next winter could be pretty tricky for, for Europe and other parts of the world and that we will see a run up in energy prices again in the second half of the year? We're not hearing that um, <clears throat> we're going to see a big run up in prices. We, do, we would agree with uh, Carolyn's assessment that they've adapted. The Europeans are, are not out of the woods. They're going to have a difficult winter again, but it won't be as difficult as we initially thought. They're going to survive. They've learned how to belt, t tighten the belt straps. They've learned how to adapt. Uh, I think in general, Europe is ready for it. But I think the bigger concern, uh, Paul, really is uh, transatlantic unity. I think what we need to start focusing on is to what extent do we need to start worrying about uh, European countries starting to differ as to how long we need to be supporting Ukraine. I think there's one thing is to find out, do we have enough LNG, do we have enough gas, can we handle uh, uh, elevated LNG prices? It's a whole other thing to start talking about how long or is this transatlantic unity going to hold with regard to Ukraine. And I think you're already starting to see cracks in the foundation of this transatlantic bloc, and that includes the United States. So for me, I think there's a broad, there's a larger political question about, uh, about that that we're going to have to take a close look at. And just to follow up on that, I mean, do you think those cracks are widening or, or starting to appear because, or in large part, because of energy and what this war is doing to uh, energy prices? For me, I think it has to do with a number of things. Prices is, is uh, we, we went back and took a look over the last several years, particularly in 2022, at the number of protests around the world. We did a, a, a protest tracker as a result of high energy prices. And the more you look around the world and you see protests, energy protests, food pri high food price protests, inflation, you start to see that, when, particularly in relation to decarbonization, I know we're going to talk about that too, but when you see politicians, when, they have, when they're faced with having to make a choice of preserving aggressive climate policies, uh, or actually backing away in the interest of easing consumer pain, they're always going to choose the latter. And you've seen a proliferation of protests all around the world from, and nobody is spared from it, from wealthy democracies, advanced countries in Europe, uh, to poor countries in Africa, it doesn't matter. There are protests going on everywhere, and a lot of it's directed to, uh, to energies. And when you look at expiring subsidies, tax cuts that are going to expire this year, on the horizon, uh, be it in Brazil, be it in, in India and places like that, you start to see uh, the, the, the likely geopolitical manifestations of this sort of war on, on, on energy. And Frank, turning to you, what are, what are your thoughts on that? When you look at, um, as Scott calls it, the trans transatlantic union, um, are you pretty optimistic uh, that it's going to, to, to hold? Um, especially, uh, and sort of linked to that, what is, you know, what is the state of play for energy markets over the course of this year vis-a-vis -vis the, the war in Ukraine? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think the, you know, Scott pointed out some of how, how high energy prices creates, uh, you know, unrest, uh, political unrest, and, and, and people get angry. It's a responsible, it's an it's a expected kind of result. Um, I mean, look in the case of the United States. The president, President Biden, did an unprecedented thing. He issued releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for the first time in history, overtly to address fuel prices at home prior to the election. This SPR has been used before, but this is the first time it was explicit for price controls. That's a that's a it's non-trivial uh, difference from 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 earlier utilizations of this, and this is intended to be. You know, part of the International Energy Agency, an energy response architecture that was established in the aftermath of the oil crisis of the 1970s. And, and so, what I think it has profound implications going forward. I think going to the, the European question in particular, <clears throat> particularly in the gas context, is yes, Europe has fared far better. I mean, divine intervention did help with the weather, but, but also the reallocation of gas cargoes from other destinations. Um, you know, the U.S. government has been pretty much on the front foot in encouraging other uh, gas customers to not accept those cargoes and re 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 
send them to Europe instead. And, and so this is going to have knock-on effects uh, going forward. I'd also like to take issue a little bit with the premise of is, is the, the kind of conventional assumption that this is that this uh, energy crisis is is accelerating the energy transition. Um, I think it's important to also call to question transitioning to where and from whom. Um, Germany, of course, uh, and, and when I served at the State Department, I had one of the roles I had was to advance energy-related sanctions. And I had many, many discussions with European countries, and Germany in particular, and the, the psychology of a state meaningfully changes when they're in a dependency mindset. And as we go forward, and as China is the energy, clean technology manufacturer to the world, are we transitioning away a certain degree of our own sovereignty to that of a rising, uh, uh, you know, the, one of the greatest challenges to, to, to the U.S. and kind of Western, Western way of doing business and, and democracy, et cetera. Thank you. I'd like to touch a bit more on that uh, in, in a short while because it's a, f a fascinating um, a topic. But I just wanted to turn to sanctions and specifically those uh, on Russia's energy exports. Ex exports. Um, you've obviously worked in the U.S. government as a, as a um, uh, let's say a sanctions apply or someone who's worked heavily with sanctions in the past. And you have been critical of uh, these, uh, the sanctions imposed on Russia's energy exports since it, uh, the invasion in February last year. Can you just talk to us about w w why are you critical of them? Uh, and also, w what would be your solution? What would you do differently? Yeah, it's, uh, thank you. I, I, the challenge is where to, to, to answer that question where we are today versus what we should have done before. Um, firstly, the media would conflate energy, between, uh, Russia's energy, and would conflate oil and gas and treat them as, as if they were uh, had some parity, and they didn't. They weren't. Russia used, uh, realized, it was, they, they exported gas for influence and power, and they exported oil for revenue and money. Uh, and, and so when they, in the case of Europe and the gas, uh, there was an asymmetry in terms of what Russia received versus what they were able to project in, in terms of th that dependency mindset. What I proposed was uh, to take a playbook out of the, the imposition of oil sanctions in the past and to phase in sanctions on Russia's oil, by and large leave the gas alone. It, wasn't a, a meaningful contributor to the revenue that's, bought, that's, that's aiding the war chest. Focus on the, ga on the oil and phase in reductions over time. Now this would also require a, a, a constructive, comprehensive and holistic engagement with Gulf producing states as well as a collaborative uh, relationship with the U.S. oil industry. Um, two, unfortunately, two, two factors that haven't uh, been uh, terribly positive in many respects. Um, but I would have focused on the oil, go after the oil, phase it in, and then slowly uh, look toward the, the imposition of secondary sanctions. The, look, what our policy instead has been to message uh, a harder line than we're actually taking. In part, it goes back to the comments I made about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve release. Whenever one wants to impose sanctions, we want to ensure that the, it, it, it's targeted on the malign actor and not doesn't have spill-on effects. And so it's, it, it's, a, it's a challenging thing to do to maintain oil flow but try to deprive revenue. Um, I think it's the square circle that is trying to, <laughs> trying to be achieved right now. Um, according to media reporting, I don't know how well it's working. Um, but... Uh, but we're not making a dent. To really have a dent on such a big producer like Russia, it would require all of us to pay more. And uh, that's, that's not happening. It's in the something that Western countries are not pre uh, prepared um, uh, to do. Scott, just turning to you um, on 
uh, if I may focus on Russian, uh, Russian oil exports and also sanctions as well. Firstly, do you sort of agree with Frank's view that the uh, sanctions um, as they've been imposed uh, haven't really worked or haven't been best imposed? And also, what are, you, what are your views for, let's say, this year or even in the, in the longer run on Russian oil exports? The country is producing, pumping, give or take, about 10 million barrels a day. Do you think it will be able to keep that up, or do you think it's inevitable that at some stage sanctions are going to force it uh, to, to lower output? Uh, I would agree with Frank. I don't think that we're, we're, we're serious enough to actually uh, withstand the pain, that would, what it would take to actually implement secondary sanctions or the phased sanctions approach that he's talking about. We're not willing to do that. It's very evident in the policy that the Biden administration has chosen the price cap. They've tried to actually have it both ways. They've tried to have it so that Russia oil continues to flow, but revenues can, uh, somehow shrink. And they believe that this is the best way to manage pressure on Russia while making sure that there's not too much pressure in the form of higher oil prices for everybody. So uh, they believe that it's working. They're going to continue that policy. And if anything, they're, they're sticking with it. And the focus now is on enforcement. The focus now is on the next phase of it. It's on implementing it. And I think they're sticking with it. I don't think they're even close to considering the idea of secondary sanctions, to Frank's point. So if, there, if there's a, a sacrifice that we would have to collectively make to really make Russia feel the, 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 you know, the pain of a, uh, a multinational effort, coordinated sanctions effort, I don't see any indication that we're going to do it. But I do agree that's what would be necessary if we really wanted to actually drive down uh, uh, drive down their production and exports and make it hurt for them. But as far as their pr the, the sort of looking ahead of their production, I think that the, 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 it's going to be hard to get them below 10. I think that there was, they were, they were, the jury was out as to whether they could maintain 10.5 even before the real war in Ukraine started. Uh, I think there were, there were questions about where their production was heading by 2025. Were they peaking? Were they going to be able to maintain it at that level? So I, I, I don't think that the war has changed that all that much, to be honest with you. But I think that if we did get serious about sanctions, I think there is a way to, start to, to significantly reduce it uh, from, from, from levels where they are now. And Carolyn, I might, I might also ask you a follow-up on, on sanctions as well. Um, um, Scott, Scott is saying that secondary sanctions, and I, I guess you're talking about sanctions that might be imposed on India or China for, for buying Russian oil are not going to be put in place. Um, is that something you agree with? And if so, why? Why do you think the, the American government and European governments would be so against that? Is it simply because they wouldn't want... Uh, to disrupt what, disrupt what relationship they have with allies like uh, in India and raise tensions with China further? So I agree with both. Um, yeah, I agree with, with, with what Scott here in terms of, I, I, I don't think that the United States would go towards secondary sanctions, even though maybe there could be, you know, I think the reality is, is that Russian production hasn't been dramatically hit. They've been making a lot of money through the sale of their oil. Countries such as, you know, India have been, you know, have benefited tremendously um, buying discounted oil, which has also helped build out the India's refinery sector. Um, I, you know, for the United States to put to sanction countries that are buying Russian oil, um, again, I think it's, I think it's particularly complicated. Uh, so I don't, I don't foresee that happening. I. I also, you know, I think the problems with the sanctions and Russia's actions is Russia just, they know how to get around the sanctions. They know how to, you know, whether you're, they're using dark tankers, whatever they're doing, how they sort of have moved their traders to sort of work in places that are sort of not under the sanctions regime. So, you know, even up and through the first six months of the, of the war, you still had a, a lot of Russian gas going into, um, into Europe. Europe continues to buy uh, Russian LNG. Uh, you know, so I think it's a very, it's a very complicated picture. I do think the, the you know, the sanctions um, are important, but I also think that, you know, countries sort of learn how to get around them, and Russia has, a, I think, has kind of in many ways been effective at getting around the sanctions so that it doesn't have the, the same type of economic pain. Um, and I think we also kind of have to go back. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're very, we've been very much focused on the last year. But, you know, this, you know, 2014, when Russia's first invasion of Ukraine, and then there was a set of sanctions, but those sanctions were very much designed not to target 
um, Russian contemporary production at the time. It was very much about to sort of limit um, financing for future production, but now here we are. It's, you know, it's 2023. Russia produces 10 and a half million barrels a day, and they've been able to, I mean, that's why the title of this, you know, this whole conference, it's the reshaping, it's a whole remapping. So you just sort of see sort of Russia hydrocarbons that used to go west are now going east. So China just signed uh, another very long-term uh, contract with Russia. Uh, they, you know, they signed a, a very long contract, which is what we see from the Power of Siberia line. That was signed in May of 2014, and then in February of 2022, there was another long-term um, um, gas deal that was made with Russia. So, uh, you know, I, I think where you see um, real hits to um, Russia's exports into Europe, but you're seeing it just get displaced elsewhere and being um, bought by other, other countries. And Damalola, turning to you and switching gears slightly, I'd like to ask about the energy transition. And um, Frank so, sort of said essentially that this idea that the energy transition is obviously accelerating because of what's happened in the past year um, uh, related to, to the war in the Ukraine is simplistic. Um, wh what's your view on that? Do you think that... Um, the energy transition has been accelerated and in some ways boosted by the events of the past year, or are you not so optimistic about that? Thank you very much. I, I think uh, the, the events in Ukraine sort of show that uh, without energy security, there can be no global security. And I think um, three points can be made in that regard. Number one, uh, the, the events show the need to diversify energy sources, the supply, where we get our energy from. And you've seen development in that area. You've seen a number of countries now looking to Qatar, looking to Nigeria, and the rest for their gas supplies. We're going to see increase in that pattern. And um, the, the world cannot continue to rely on one source for, for energy. So I think that's, that will be lesson number one for me. Um, Lesson number two is the pace in which some of the new sources have been able to increase the reliability of their supply as well. And that, again, shows the need for reliability if we were to achieve energy security. Energy sources must ensure that they carefully study the threats to the reliability of supply, how they can meet the supply demand, uh, the, the, the demand uh, as at when due, and how they can strengthen um, resilience to boost that reliability. I think um, what happened with, the event, with, with Ukraine uh, then meant that, uh, you know, while countries like Qatar were able to step in, a number of countries, due to pre-existing challenges, were not able to take advantage of that uh, increased demand. And Nigeria will be one of them, you know, due to, you know, um, infrastructure challenges and, and, and the likes. Um, you know, rather than uh, becoming seen as reliable suppliers, they've not been able to overcome. We've, we've rather seen the opposite, divestments, patterns of divestment uh, from, from, from uh, the, the energy market in, in some of the African uh, countries. So I think that points to the need, again, to revitalize infrastructure investments in those countries such that they can be able to strengthen reliability and resilience uh, you know, as trusted suppliers. Now, a third point, and, and uh, going back to the point you, you made about energy transition, one reason why a number of developing countries could not sort of step in is because of the increased uh, pace of divestment as a result of decarbonization, increased emphasis on decarbonization. Now, the climate change problem is a global emergency, which we must take seriously. Uh, but of course, we must also ask uh, you know, how can we do that in a manner that does not worsen uh, energy security? I think the world faces two equally important emergencies, climate change emergency and energy poverty emergency. This is 2023. A number of countries in Africa still rely on biomass for cooking. Um, electrification rate is less than 20% in some countries. So if the world is focusing a lot only on, uh, on the climate emergency, Leaving aside the energy poverty emergency, I think we are going to only worsen 
uh, uh, you know, uh, threats to, to global security. Do you think there's been any kind of change or, if you might say, a U-turn from, uh, from Western countries and Western institutions uh, uh, about this? Because until recently, it was, very, it was extremely difficult for, say, a Nigeria or a Mozambique or Uganda to get funding from Western organizations or banks for anything to do with fossil fuels, whether it was a refinery or an, uh, an LNG export terminal or, or new oil developments or whatever. Um, I mean, I think this year I've seen, uh, maybe I'm not so sure on that particular front, but a shift in tone from uh, Western energy companies about uh, them sort of saying they're going to slow down the pace at which they move to renewable energy and focus uh, a little bit harder on oil and gas than they thought they would do a year ago. You have Joe Biden sort of castigating oil companies in, in, uh, in the US now for paying out billions of dollars to shareholders instead of increasing production. So, I mean, from the point of view of, let's say, emerging markets, do you think there's been a shift in that it will now get a bit easier for uh, these countries to get funding for these, uh, let's say, LNG and oil projects that they, um, that they would like to develop or not necessarily? I think the answer is uh, not necessarily. And that is because, you know, we, the starting point of fighting climate change, which we all agreed upon, was the need for mitigation and the need for adaptation. Mitigation, lowering greenhouse gas is very, very important. But what about the adaptation aspect, especially energy adaptation? They need to provide financing to repurpose existing infrastructure such that we can then use them in a manner that will support uh, energy security. You know, so the, the, the energy adaptation aspect has been largely missing, and the end result is that uh, countries and companies are announcing decarbonization plans, but they are not announcing energy adaptation plans. So they are not financing energy adaptation projects. It's difficult to get financing for uh, infrastructure repurposing. It's difficult to get uh, you know, financing for waste management in the, in the oil and gas sector. It's difficult to get financing for value chain uh, issues, managing sustainable cooling and the likes. So you see a, a need for financial institutions and all stakeholders in the energy uh, sector to recenter the, uh, uh, the, the debate, not only on climate mitigation, but also as well as on climate adaptation, energy adaptation, uh, the need to make uh, financing available for entrepreneurial ventures and innovations and projects, really, that can support uh, sustainable investment in adaptation uh, projects. Thank you. And turning to you, Carolyn, what's, what's your view on that? So, in your question, you talked about U-turns, and I think that's been something interesting, and Frank, you referenced it. You know, I think today the Biden administration is going to announce an $8 billion project in Alaska that would have been hard to have imagined at the start of, you know, Biden's um, term as president that he would be announcing such a, a large, you know, fossil-based um, project. So we've seen even BP has sort of retreated from, from their um, uh, commitments to investments in renewables. They said that they're going to sort of for longer be um, investing in hydrocarbons and increase um, investments in hydrocarbons. And again, I think this all goes back to this question of energy security and what we've seen over the last year. Um, and I think something that's really important to also mention is when we're thinking about you know, the energy transition and or energy security is that as, as countries really think about their own domestic energy security, they're thinking about proximity, they're thinking about cost, reliability, building resilience. And one of the, you know, kind of unfortunate turns we've also seen is this year where, you know, 2023, 2022, we've seen very large increases in coal consumption. So countries that were priced out of the LNG market, like Pakistan and Bangladesh, have doubled down on, um, on using coal. Even India just recently um, announced that they were going to retreat from some of their, um, some of their targets. And we've seen increases in coal. This has been a record year, both 2022 and we're anticipating 2023 for coal consumption. So I think as much as there are some really ambitious targets out there, I think the, the hard realities of you know, countries being confronted with deep energy insecurity is, is in some ways pushing them towards like heavier reliance on those fossil energies that they have closer proximity to and that are, you know, uh, 
you know, don't, don't, don't have the same sort of geopolitical risks associated with that. Thank you. And Scott, that sort of uh, brings us, if you like, to the, the whole question of investment uh, in, in fossil fuels. Um, a lot of, I mean, you hear it a lot in this country. I mean, I, I, you know, I cover the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and you know, both the governments and Saudi Aramco and Adnoc have been saying for quite a long time there just isn't enough investment in oil and gas. Aramco was saying that yesterday when it, when it announced, you know, blowout uh, results for 2022. As I mentioned, Joe Biden is kind of saying that as well now. Um, just what is, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think if if we talk about uh, let's say the US and Europe, that the governments there are doing enough to encourage more fossil uh, fuel investment? Do you think that's going to happen? Or do you think that's just unlikely because of everything to do with the uh, clean energy movement in the last decade or so, and also the fact that shareholders in a lot of these places don't seem to want their companies to invest in oil and gas much anymore? No, it's a good question. I, I almost think, um I almost think it's too late in a way because when you look at when you look at the structural supply problem that the global oil market has right now, uh, nobody's invested. As you said, there's been underinvestment for a very long time. Uh, there's no there's no long cycle investment going into additional production capacity at all. And then to make matters even worse, when you look at spare current spare production capacity, and depending on how generous you want to be, it's down to about two two and a half million barrels a day. Two and a half million barrels a day by historical standards is extremely low. It's razor thin. So if there's ever a serious outage or disruption, you know, the Saudis and the Emiratis and others, the, the, the few remaining countries who actually hold spare production capacity uh, have very little with which to deal with supply disruptions. So we've reached a point right now, and Abdul, uh, uh, Abdulaziz bin Salman, the Saudi energy minister, others in this region have been sounding the alarm bells on this for a while now. Not only underinvestment, not only razor thin spare production capacity, but there's another problem that people don't want to talk about, and that is the marginal uh, producer collapse. You've got, if there are 20 plus countries in OPEC plus, we tend to have, a, the conversation tends to focus on Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait and a few others. But what about, you know, you look at the ones that are structurally dead, Venezuela's of the world, states that uh, have gone to pa past the, the point of no return. They're not coming back, they're broken. Deeply stressed states, the ones where you have the perennial risk of barrels coming on, barrels coming off, where the only, really, the only fully de-risked production in those countries is almost offshore. You, you have Libya's of the world, you have Nigeria's, you have Iraq's, and they have problems that aren't going away. Then you have a bunch of other countries, the ones that aren't mentioned so often, Malaysia struggling to, to, to stay at 350. You've got Algeria's because of political atrophy. And the list, Caspian producers, the list goes on and on and on. Those countries collectively are a major concern. It's a major supply problem because when you look at globally, we'll call it barrels at risk, risk of geopolitical disruption, risk of deterioration, uh, there's millions of barrels at risk far in excess of what our spare capacity is. So the structural problem in the market is so bad right now that even if we started to see things trending in our favor, whether it's U.S. investment, whether it's uh, here in the Gulf where we start to say, okay, we're going to slow down in this transition, welcome our Gulf partners into the broader energy transition discussion and hit the reset button and figure out how to go about this in a smarter way, to Frank's point, they should have been included from the beginning, but if we're going to restart that journey, there is a serious supply problem. And if you're looking at the balances the way we look at them, the oil fundamental balances going forward, we still have oil demand growth out, far outpacing oil supply growth through this decade. And we're going to run, if, if it's true that we are really going to run out of spare capacity 2027 or 28, we've got a really serious problem. And, th and that's why, again, if we've just come out of a 2014 to 2021 kind of a bust cycle in oil prices, depressed oil prices, the exact opposite is where we're headed. So if you're trying to actually figure out how to navigate an oil, something as complex and difficult as an energy transition, if we're going to have a conversation about injecting realism into the energy transition discussion and the planning of it, you better start with the state of uh, the oil sector and hydrocarbon markets in general. Thanks, Scott. And Frank, just on that point, um, I mean, do you also think there are serious supply problems uh, in the oil market, if not the oil and gas market? 
And if so, do you think the oil markets are, let's say, being uh, underestimating this problem? Because if you look at oil prices at the moment, uh, they're down about 6% this year. When I uh, checked about an hour ago, Brent was at $81 a barrel, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's not that high by historical standards and certainly, certainly far lower than it was back in uh, June of last year when it was around $125 a barrel. It seems that a lot of at least macro investors just point to uh, soft, uh, you know, soft global economic growth this year and a lot of them just don't seem to think there is a supply problem uh, in the oil market. Um, so just on that, do you think there is one in our markets uh, being a bit naive about this? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, there's absolutely, and, and Scott spoke in depth about this, and, and I can completely concur. I mean, you know, capital is a coward. You know, it, it, it flees where it's not wanted, and it's not wanted in a lot of the places that we're talking about in the oil patch in the United States. Uh, hence the, you know, the, the, the share buybacks and the dividend yields, rather than reinvestment at scale. Um, some of those, some of those positions, some of those plays are, are kind of increasingly tapped out, um, and there isn't because of the headwind on, uh, 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 in terms of at least in the West against oil, you're not seeing the the, the scale of deep water exploration, the kind of long long cycle oil projects that traditionally would otherwise be pretty reasonable to ex anticipate. So, um, I, I don't see how this will correct itself anytime soon, and that, hence I think that's why you're seeing some of the tepid policies, tough talk, but very tepid policies in terms of oil sanctions on, on Russia. And I would also throw in uh, countries like, you know, Venezuela. The U.S. is increasingly given conditional licenses to, 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 to restart production in Venezuela. Um, you know, there, you know, in terms of the, mentioned the JCPOA earlier, but in terms of Iran oil shipments, uh, I mean, it's, it's illicit barrels, according to public reporting, is kind of a, through the roof in terms of some of these other uh, countries that have, you know, three and four X their export volumes beyond their production. How does that happen? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point of illicit shipping for, for, those, for those uranium bar barrels. So, so there, there's a lot um, being talked about that's not happening. And then what we're seeing in terms of the West uh, not seeing the capital formation and the investment for the projects to change the course trajectory. What is, what's the implications of this? The implications are, uh, and, and as we've spoken before, you know, the, the international financial institutions are prohibiting investing in oil and gas in the developing and the emerging economies. Um, and so uh, this is going to simply increase the relative importance, the prominence of this region of the traditional incumbent producers of scale. Yeah, there certainly is that, uh, it certainly is a case where you do see some investments being sort of obstructed. And I think it was uh, the OPEC uh, secretary, oh, sorry, it was the head of Aramco who uh, about two weeks ago spoke out against, or was critical of ESG investors uh, saying that they were, say, uh, say that they were saying that they were doing just that. And, Damalolo, on that point, do we have this at the moment? Do we have this sort of very, uh, this dichotomy uh, between those who want to push very quickly towards the energy transition and those who are saying, no, we'll still need oil and gas for years, if not decades to come? And do, do you think it's an argument that can be squared or do you think the two sides are so um, opposed to each other that, you know, we're going to be heading into <laughs> uh, some kind of, a, or another crisis on, the, on this in the years to come? Thank you. It's a good question, and, and I, when we when we learn from history, we see that uh, um, there is a need to focus on environmentally preferable products, as we call them. That is um, fuels that are transition fuels that can support that that can serve as that bridge, you know, to bring all sides together on one table. And of course, natural gas is proven in studies to be a transition fuel. Now, if we don't increase investment in transition fuels, what we see is sustainability reversal. For example, anytime there is fuel scarcity in Nigeria, people go back to wood to cook, and people go back to coal. So we need to sustain investment in environmentally preferable products 
such that there is no sustainability reversal. So it is a message that must be consistently understood by all sides, and we must know that if we really want to move uh, the transition forward, it has to be done in a practical and uh, you know, sustainable and pragmatic uh, uh, manner. As well, you know, whenever um, this transition debate hinders investment, another thing is that it creates security risk. You see increased competition for resources, which is then leading to increase in terrorism and violence in many parts of Nigeria, which did not exist in the past due to increased struggle and scramble for resources. So you see, it's a security risk, it's a sustainability risk, it's a justice risk as well. You know, when we have thousands of people, we have the International Labour Organization talking about thousands of people losing their jobs as a result of transition. We have a number of countries in Africa that are in debt crisis because they have resources under the ground that they are not able to produce. So they are in debt crisis, you know, and then you say transition. And then we ask, give me a debt for nature swap as well. If you want me to transition, I'm ready to transition, but why don't you give me debt forgiveness and use that debt to sustain, you know, to, to finance transition projects? So we need that sort of innovative approach that addresses the justice questions in the transition debate. Thank you, Damanola. And we haven't got too long left, so I'm going to focus the, fi uh, the final questions on, on this region uh, in, in, uh, in particular, let's say, let's say the Gulf. And obviously, the Qatar uh, and countries, other countries in this region, like Saudi Arabia, like the UAE, like the Oman, they're enjoying a bit of a, an economic boom at the moment, in large part because of what uh, en energy prices, oil and gas prices did last year. As I mentioned, uh, Aramco announced its results yesterday, $161 billion of net income in 2022, which it's difficult to tell, but may well have been the biggest corporate record, uh, biggest corporate profit in 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 history. Um, I'm sure that Qatar Energy and Adnoc, which aren't listed, also had blowout years last year too. So, and this is enabling these countries to do all sorts of things. We're seeing investments abroad. We're seeing them open up their economies even even further. Um, how long do you, Carolyn? I'll start with you. How long do you think this sort of uh, this boom period will last for? for the likes of Qatar and Saudi Arabia uh, and, um, and the UAE? So I'm smiling because I'm looking at Scott because <laughs> I think Scott is better to answer sort of the boom bust cycle on um, things. But I think to your point, you know, given, given the state of the world, you know, a region that is rich in resources, rich in oil and natural gas, like, you know, Qatar has increased its um, exports to China. Um, you know, the north field of Qatar is, is, is considered to be very, very important for sort of future, future gas production. Uh, and of course, as you pointed out, Saudi Arabia. So I think, you know, you see, I think across, across, across these countries, you also see kind of like both end, um, increased emphasis and investment in, in their hydrocarbon spaces, but also doing projects that will, um, you know, that, that sort of show them moving in that Period, in that area of transition in terms of solar projects and um, hydrogen for um, for Saudi for Saudi Arabia you know also there's there's advantage that they have in terms of building building projects um, domestically that allow them to export more right so that they have um, they they have you know, maybe it's nuclear energy or it's hydrogen that they can use for domestic consumption and that they can export the higher priced fossil fuels. But I think, you know, whether it be Qatar, whether it be, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE, I think all of the countries have sort of reaffirmed their commitment to increasing their hydrocarbon. So I see that they're, you know, they're, they're going to be in the game for the long run, um, and Saudi Arabia will probably be, you know, the last oil country standing with regards to um, not not allowing for stranded assets to remain in the ground. And and Scott, your uh, your thoughts on that? No, I was going. <clears throat> excuse me. I was going to say, I agree. That's well put. Again, there's such a desperate need, I think, at this point for transparency in this broader discussion. F figuring out how quickly Saudi Arabia, for one, can go up to 13 million barrels, you know, uh, 13 million barrels a day, 13.5, 14. How much money that would take to get them there is going to be 20 billion per per million barrel a day increase, like it was historically. There's going to be a lot more. Is there a tolerance for them to do that? Because if you look at the Saudi mindset, um, 
again, they, they, they are not willing to go it alone. They're not going to be the world's only swing producer anymore. We've seen that. So if, if, it's, if they're convinced it's nobody else is going to com commit to this and invest this way, then again, I, I come back to our starting point has to be we could have a serious supply problem. If there is a collective effort to manage this together, then yeah, there is plenty of money to go in and, bu and build, uh, build additional capacity, but it's not something that happens overnight. It takes a long time. And uh, I, I, again, it's, it's, it's hard to stress how big of a problem, how big of a problem this is. Yeah, and as you say, these capacity increases take a lot of time and money. I mean, Saudi Arabia's will take about five years to increase by a million barrels a day, and the UAE is, is doing something similar. But elsewhere in the world, there's, there's not much um, happening on, on that front. Um, Frank, your, your thoughts on what um, uh, the sort of rise in energy prices over the last year means for this region and also for its relationships, relationships with, um, with Europe and, uh, and the US and also China? Well, I, I think what I was reflecting on when my, my panelists were speaking, I, I was reflecting more on what they're doing with the money. And uh, what I was struck by, I mean, Qatar, I think, was ahead of the curve in this in terms of where they're deploying their capital for, these, for this money that they've earned. I mean, since I believe it was 2020, the Qatar Investment Authority stopped investing in, in fossil energy. They've increased their green-related spending. They were ahead of the curve. We're talking about this boom right now, but they were ahead of the curve. Um, the UAE, uh, Mazdar is the second biggest renewables company in the world. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, they've expanded. They now have, uh, they just finished the second annual conference on the Future Minerals Forum, uh, a global forum to look at minerals for the energy transition and developing new processing because they're seeking a hedge from the oil economy and so starting to look under the sand to find out what else is there besides oil and gas. So I, I'm, I'm struck by the dynamism of the region and also the, as, as, as particularly Western countries uh, and, and Japan uh, are looking to, you know, the, one of the, the buzzwords these days is decarbonizing hard to abate industries, right? So that's steel making and cement. You're seeing this, this redevelopment of these industries here in this region because of the inexpensive energy prices, the political will to have manufacturing here, and of course, ge geographically, they're advantaged for an export. So, so I think it, it's, it's a kind of a, a pretty dramatic transformation that's occurring. We, I think it's important to think about this region also looking forward, um, that, is there, that they are looking beyond just the oil economy, but it seems like us in the West, we're, we're still only thinking through that lens. Um, so I, I think it's, it's absolutely transformative, but of course it's, it's going to be the bedrock of their funding for, for decades. Um, but uh, but they're, they're looking at this energy transition to build on what's there, where I think our thinking sometimes in, uh, in the U.S. and in Europe principally is, is to uh, eliminate and then replace, and that is much easier said than done. Yeah, that's a very good point. And for that they're investing in oil and gas, these, these uh, countries in this region are also investing hugely in renewable energy and solar and wind and, uh, and also in hydrogen and, and carbon uh, capture too. Um, Damalola, last word to you. Do you think um, the countries in, uh, in this energy-rich region are going to be able to carry that out successfully, both sort of, let's say, riding uh, the wave of high fossil fuel prices at the moment while also transitioning to position themselves um, to, uh, um, to, you know, to become big renewable or clean fuel producers when, you know, when that transition uh, has actually fully happened, let's say? Yes, I think so. I think uh, countries in the region realize the opportunities that arise in this regard. And there's uh, talk about a new sort of renewable energy superpowers being uh, uh, formed. And of course, countries like Qatar are leading that uh, charge. Qatar, for example, is investing in a $1 billion blue ammonia project, and uh, as well as a number of other innovative projects on renewable energy. I think if this pattern continues, then you see countries in the region taking the lead, um, becoming the, you know, the hub for, for renewable energy. And I think that's the way to go, taking uh, you know, 
concentrating investment and resources into uh, energy diversification uh, programs. Another key thing that is happening here is the increased investment in research on energy transition. You see a wide range of institutions, uh, including our chair, the UNESCO chair, working on renewable energy uh, education, training, capacity building. I think if that uh, pattern continues, then you will see that over the next few years, uh, countries in the region, especially Qatar, will become the hub for knowledge in this area. And I think, um, you know, a, a, a final point is that uh, countries in the region are also working on strengthening reliability as well, like I mentioned, ensuring that um, they can then, uh, you know, do a sort of value chain uh, assessment of trust to reliability of supply, uh, such that, you know, reliability can be improved and they can then, you know, be able to, uh, you know, meet the growing demand for transition fuels. Damanola, thank you. And I'd like to thank all my panelists today, Carol, uh, Carolyn, Scott, Frank, and Damanola. It's been a fascinating discussion, uh, and I hope you, uh, everyone in the audience, find it too. Thank you. Thank you.